morning, church. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome to worship at Hunts Memorial United Methodist Church. It's so good to have you all in worship this morning. Um, I want to thank you all for clearly, you're so good at socially distancing. You're managing this without the ropes. Um, we are so thrilled to move into the blue level of our COVID plan this week, which basically means everything's the same, except there's no ropes on the pews. Um, and so you're smart people who can figure out how to sit in a way where you feel comfortable throughout the worship service. Um, I will give the disclaimer that if you don't want to shake hands, you don't have to. And if you feel like you're getting crowded on the way out of church, you can go this way. And so I just want to give those disclaimers if you're feeling a little crowded on your way out of church today because I know there's some COVID anxiety out in the air this morning. Today's the third Sunday of Advent, and I can't believe we're three out of four Sundays all the way to Christmas already. We had a wonderful labyrinth retreat gathering yesterday. I was told by so many people how wonderful it was, and it's good to gather and worship today on the Sunday of joy. As we gather and worship, would you stand and greet your neighbors? No handshakes required if you don't want to. But stand and just take the moment to greet your neighbors and introduce yourself. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning.
and right after the candlelight, we're doing children's message. So any kids who are going to come up for children's message, would you come up now? And we're going to sit right here at the front of the aisle so we can see what's happening for candlelighting, and then we'll do the children's message. We're going to land right here together. <laughs>
So that's how we count down the days. And once it's Christmas time in the church, we turn all the clocks to white because in the church, anytime it's a very special, special day, there's white and gold up front. That's our fancy special day that represents how holy and special God is. So I just wanted to tell you about that and tell you why it is that we have all these different colors in here. Because you might walk in here and say, that doesn't look very Christmassy, but it's very Adventy, where we're waiting and waiting. And we also have hints of Christmas. That's right, because as we wait for Christmas, we have little hints of it, like when you see a trailer to a movie, and it really makes you want to see the movie. Yeah, we see some red things over there, huh? That's right. And we have these beautiful wreaths up on the wall that, that Mr. Brian and everybody else put up. And so all these decorations are nice and yes, ready and excited for Christmas time. Can you guys repeat after me in the prayer? We're going to pray to God and ask God to help us wait Wait for Christmas. Dear God, thank you for Christmas. Thank you for joy. Thank you for excitement. Help us to wait very patiently. Let's pray the Lord's Prayer together with a whole congregation. Ready to say. Our Father, who are in heaven, Hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. All right, thanks, guys. I think all of you are going to go to the rehearsals for we're getting ready for Christmas and getting ready during Advent. So have fun, guys. seeing the kids prepare for the Christmas pageant. Uh, so as a reminder, we have three worship services come Christmas Eve. So 4 p.m. is when the Christ children's Christmas pageant will take place, and then there will be 9 p.m. and 11 p.m. traditional worship service with wonderful music and candle lighting, and 11 p.m. will also include communion. Um, so I just want to remind you of that. Keep that on your radars and plan ahead for that. As we gather our hearts in prayer today, I want to ask you if you would sometime this week reach out to a couple of folks in our congregation who are in a healing process. Um, quite literally, Howard Lynn had knee surgery at last this past Sunday, uh, this past week, and so he's recovering. It sounds like he's doing well, but you know, recovery from a knee replacement is always a slow go. Um, and then Trish Funderburg continues to recover from her hip replacement and is had some complications in the midst of the recovery. So if you know those folks, would you just reach out to them and encourage them because those are some long roads to walk, as many of you know firsthand um, post knee and hip replacement. This morning in prayer, we are also lifting up those who were impacted by the tornadoes that swept through Missouri and all the way through Kentucky this week. Um, we pray for all those impacted by the disaster. Um, as always, we ask that God would help us to figure out how we can be the hands and feet of God. And if you're familiar with UMCOR, U-M-C-O-R, and this committee on relief, um, they are always already on the ground in places like this, ready to help with disaster relief. And so that would be a wonderful place to provide financial assistance if you're looking for a way to give to help the victims of this natural disaster. Let's go now to God. God, you are our light, and you are our life. And you are the one who gives us every bit of light, and the one who gives us every bit of life. And so in these days of waiting, and these days of longing, in these days of patiently and anxiously awaiting what will come next, we turn to you seeking to turn our faces toward the light. Like a plant reaches toward the sun for a source of light, we turn our faces to you. We ask that you would shine on us and shine in our hearts, Lord Jesus. 
Lord, on this third week of Advent, we remember the joy of Mary. The joy of Mary upon learning that God had chosen her to be part of your work in this world. God, we ask that you would bring us that kind of joy, that kind of unrelenting, unashamed, unblocked joy. Keep us from those things that bring us temporary happiness, but which end up spoiling in the end. Lord, bring us to the places, the deep wells of joy, where your spirit fills us with your light and your life in a way that never runs out and never runs dry. God, we pray this day for the people in our midst who need your healing and need your help. We especially lift up Trish and Howard and those people who are impacted by the tornadoes in the Midwest. God, bring your help where help is needed. And show us, nudge us, push us to see how we can be your hands and feet in each of those situations. Lord, be with us in this time and speak to us this day. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Friends, as we collect our offering this day, the offering is uh, in the back in the plate, as we're still not passing the plate, um, but you can give in the back or you can give online. I want to thank you for all the ways that you've given throughout this year. We're hoping to end this year really strong as we've been in a really strong financial position growing into this fall. We want to end in that strong position so we can start 2022 on a good foot. So thank you so much for all the ways, small and large, that you have contributed to that. Um, and by your prayers, your presence, your gifts, your service, your witness, every little bit of it makes a difference in this church community. So thank you, thank you. We're going to sing together the song, I Want to Walk as a Child of the Light. If you've been in traditional worship your whole life with the Methodist hymnal, this might be familiar. Um, and so would you rise with me as we sing this song together?
Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Today is the third Sunday of Advent. We are continuing to study the prologue of John's Gospel, which tells us all about Jesus, the light of the world. Today's scripture is John, chapter 1, verses 10 through 13. He was in the world, and the world came into being through him. Yet the world did not know him. He came to what was his own, and his own people did not accept him. But to all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power to become children of God, who were born not of blood, or of the will of the flesh, or of the will of man, but of God. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, for the word of God within us. Thanks be to God. today raises a question for me. A question that is also raised by, and this is where I'm starting, which is a little strange, I know, that is also raised by the Matrix movies. <laughs> now, is anybody here a fan of the many Matrix movies? First one came out in 1999, sci-fi dystopian situation, all of humans are in a simulated reality, and only a few people know that it's not real, and they're in a simulation. And so the few people that know can be free from the Matrix and they can help to take it down. Now, the fourth one is coming out this uh, Christmas. is not a reboot, it's a resurrection, they say. And so uh, this, this idea of being in a world where you don't know what is real and what is not real, this idea has been pervasive, right? For it to have lasted from 99 to today and make multi-million dollar movies, um, it has to be a compelling idea. And I think it is compelling for us in 2021. We live in a world where it's sometimes hard to know what's real and what's not real. What's true and what's a twisted version of a kernel of the truth. What's real and what's fake looking really real, right? We live in a world where we can see movies where uh, crazy superpowers look incredibly real and where I could be on a Zoom screen talking to you through a magic box on your desk and I can have a filter on, so you don't know that I'm not wearing any makeup, and it looks like I'm just the most beautiful person in the entire universe. We live in a world where everything is unclear, whether it's true or whether it's not true, whether it's real or whether it's not real. Today's scripture has to do a lot with that. How do we know what is true, and how do we know what is real? How do we know when we see Jesus for who Jesus really is? That's what the Gospel of John is all about. It's about seeing Jesus. It's about knowing Jesus. And it's about believing what you see and what you know about Jesus. I want to start by breaking down today's scripture because today's scripture has a lot of um, a lot of phrases that are really familiar to the church, like children of God and born again and um, the world came into being. Uh, but if, if we don't break it down, it's a little easy to let it just slide over you, like a piece of scripture that you've heard a thousand times. So let's, let's take it chunk by chunk. And I'm going to start very simple with just the first word. He, he was in the world. Now, we're starting in the middle of the prologue, right? And if you want to follow along with me, your purple insert has the entire prologue printed on it. And I'm going to be in just this bold section right here in the middle. Um, and so when you say he was in the world, wait a second. Who is he again? <laughs> Are we talking about John? Are we talking about Jesus? He was in the world. This comes right after the phrase, the true light, which enlightens everyone who's coming into the world. The word was the light. What was come into being and he was life, and the life was the light of all people. So when we see he was in the world, it picks up on this thought. He, he, the word, the logos, the word of God. Um, the word logos is a masculine uh, noun in the Greek, and 
so that his he and not she or they or it. Uh, he was in the world. The word of God was in the world. The light that was life was in the world. Now part of why I want to break this down and stop with just this first line. This is my little teaching moment to say, um, please take a moment, turn your brains inside out for a moment, because this was true before Jesus was even born. That the word of God was in the world before Jesus was even born. Right, so this is not just saying he was in the world in that Jesus Christ was born physically here on earth. It's also saying he, the word of God, was present in the world. Think of all the times in the Old Testament when God spoke, when God said, let there be light. When God said, here is my law, here are my commandments. All the times when God spoke through the prophets, the word of God was present in the world. He was in the world. The light of God was present in the world. In the world, shining light on justice, shining light on what God wanted the people to do. He was in the world. The word of God, the light of God. He, Jesus Christ, in a sense, was in the world this whole time. And the world came into being through him. Which if you've been here all of Advent, you know it's just a recap of verse 1, right? <laughs> he was in the world and the world came into being through him. Through the word of God, creation was made. He came into what was his own, his own. Now here's another double layer of meaning, right? It's both Jesus, a physical human boy, born to Jewish mother and father, came into the people of Israel, his own Jewish cultural, his own people. But it's also the double layer that God, who created all things, came into God's own creation, right? He came into what was his own in so many different ways. And yet, the tragedy is that in so many different ways, the world did not know him, and his own people did not accept him. In the Old Testament, they didn't really know it was God's word, and if they did, they didn't accept it, or they didn't listen to it. Over and over, it's the story of God's people hearing God's word and not listening to it, not accepting it into their lives, not living by God's word, and they didn't see the light of God in what God was doing. They missed it. And it's true in the layer of Jesus as well. We see over and over how when Jesus came to God's people, they didn't know it was really God in the flesh. And if they knew, they didn't really accept it. Now, with that little breakdown, I think all of this begs the question, would we recognize God if we saw him? How many of you have thought, ever thought to yourselves, like when you think about like the feeding of the 5,000 or walking on water, how many of you ever thought to yourselves, um, I would definitely get it if I saw this happening. You can raise your hand. That's okay. Yeah, yeah. A lot of us think about these miracles and we think to ourselves, um, I would have figured it out. <laughs> if I had been a disciple standing there, I would have seen this and thought to myself, oh, obviously this is the Son of God because how else would this be possible? But I wonder, truly, in this world that we live in with so many different people trying to sell us so many different things, how many of us would have truly recognized God in the flesh in front of us? Today, in 2021, when I teach you about Jesus, um, there are so many different lenses that help us think about who Jesus is. And I want to help you see this in part for understanding this scripture, and in part because what I'm about to tell you is kind of how I think about Scripture. So I think it's helpful for you to know this about your pastor. This is how I kind of think about Scripture. So in one way, we're like these glasses looking back at Jesus, back from this end of the timeline, back toward Jesus through a variety of lenses that help us understand Jesus. There's so many things between us in 2021 and Jesus in Jesus' historical day that help us understand better, right? We have the gospel texts and the writings of Paul. We have the doctrines of the church that teach us you know, about the doctrine of the Trinity and Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, these sorts of things. We have ancient and historical church teachings and traditions. We have our modern church teachings and traditions. We have our own recent experiences of God, of God speaking in our lives. All these lenses help us understand who Jesus is. The Methodists like to talk about the Wesleyan quadrilateral of how scripture, tradition, reason, and experience are the different lenses that help us to see who Jesus is. So we, we look back on Jesus through these lenses. 
But I want to argue that there's another angle to look at Jesus, and that's from the other end, right? This is what Jesus' original disciples would have had. They didn't have writings of Paul, doctrines of the church to explain what was going on. They just had what had happened so far. So they knew the oral traditions of their time. They knew the Torah, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. They knew the Talmud, the rabbinical teachings and the Jewish traditions. They knew the recent history of the Jewish community and kind of they lived in this Greco-Roman culture and context. And it's through all of those lenses that then Jesus comes on the scene and they're standing there in Jesus' day, live and in person, trying to figure out through all these lenses that they have been taught how to see Jesus. You see how those two perspectives are really different? They're really different if you look at Jesus through this way versus through this way. And the great thing is that we have the gift of being able to step back and look at it all and see the big picture of how Jesus fits into what God has been doing throughout all of human history and how these different lenses can help us understand more deeply who Jesus is. Kind of like uh, binoculars getting you closer or like a microscope helping you see what's not visible to the naked eye. When we look at Jesus, we can look through and all these lenses and we can also step back and see how all of it helps inform the bigger picture. If only life were that simple, right? Oh, if only these were the only lenses we had to look at the truth of the world. And that was it and the end. Because the truth is there's also a lot of other things that help us see the world, right? We might look at the world and ask ourselves, um, oh, look, there are things that are true, but I don't know if that's really the whole truth. And then we might see things that are, that are wrong, that contain a kernel of the truth. So are they real? Are they not? Sometimes there's situations where there really isn't a right or a wrong. Sometimes you have a leader that says, I have a plan, but they don't really have a good vision. Sometimes we have a leader who says, I have a vision, but I don't really have a good plan. Sometimes we have our traditions of American Christmas that maybe do or don't tell us more about Jesus. Sometimes we have our families that expect certain things of us that maybe do and don't tell us something about Jesus. Then we think to ourselves, what is everybody else doing? What does everybody else think is the right thing to do? And what should I be worrying about? And does anyone have a good answer? And how do I reconcile all this ancient wisdom with my modern values? And how do we understand these traditions in today's modern era? And then I have anxiety, and depression, and fear. And then some people claim they have wisdom, but they're lying. And then just, just fill in the blank. Just, just fill in the blank of all the different things that could get in the way of seeing straight to who Jesus is and what Jesus is doing in the world. There are so many things that try to shine light on different parts of our lives that can kind of flood out the true light of the world that is coming into the world. It's kind of like the idea of light pollution. If you've ever tried to go stargazing um, in your backyard, you probably had some trouble. It's hard to see the stars when you live in an area like Ruxton, Riderwood, Towson, Baltimore. It's hard to see the stars in this suburban, urban community. If you had been here 200, 300 years ago, I imagine 250 years ago when people started worshiping here on this hill, they were probably able to look up at night and see the Milky Way galaxy because there was no other light polluting the world. But in these days, you can see on this map how, how much light is produced, especially in parts of Europe and the east coast of the United States, that the lights of our cities and suburbs, they flood so much that we can't see the stars above us. Now, I'm not anti-electricity. Obviously, I'm a big fan of electricity. I use light a lot at our house. Smart bulbs in every room is my friend. This is how I work. Um, but science has told us that this light pollution has a real effect. There are real effects on our ecosystems from light flooding out how God originally put creation together. And if you think about it metaphorically, you can think about it this way. That it's not until you get away from the lights or you strip down all the other lights that are not real, that you're able to see the real light that God has placed in your life. Think about it metaphorically, that the beauty of the light that God has created, the lights of the constellations and the Milky Way, and if you're far enough north, even the Aurora Borealis, they're only visible when all the other lights are stripped away. This is one of the things we do in Advent. We try to slow down and take enough time, even if it's just on Sundays or five minutes of devotion a day, we try to slow down and take enough time to 
quiet the other lights, to dim the other lights, so that we can see how the light of the, the Lord coming into the earth is shining brightly in a way that can lead us forward. And that is the hope, the promise that John leaves us with this day. Because so far, uh, this scripture has been a bit depressing, has it not? It says, he came into the world, um, the world came into being through, but nobody got it, and nobody accepted him. That would be a very bad place for us to end. But the good news that John leaves us with is this, that all for all who received him, who believed in his name, he gave power, power to become children of God, who were born not of blood or of the will of flesh or of the will of man, but of God. He gave power to become children of God. Now, uh, when you think power to become children of God, um, my, my first instinct is to think of somebody uh, like the Avengers, where they get like superpowers. <laughs> and so you think like, oh, now we have superpowers, and we don't have any problems anymore, because we can fight evil, and we can beat all the bad guys, because we have the superpowers to become like children of God, and we're essentially gods ourselves, like Thor, and we don't have any problems anymore. Shocker, that's not what this means. <laughs> the power to become children of God. Power is more like standing. Uh, you have standing as a child of God. You can stand, you have kind of the grounds that, that a child of God would stand on. Power, like the powerful moment of a baby's birth as a child of God. Like being born again as a child of God. Now, I have not ever heard a woman who has given birth Describe that process with words like easy, simple, uh, no sweat, refreshing, <laughs> uplifting, clean, uncomplicated, no surprises. I have never heard a mother who has given birth describe any part of it in that way. Birth is a messy process. There is blood, there is sweat. There are tears, there are muscles involved, there are complications. Things happen that you did not expect would happen at some point. Giving birth is not simple or no sweat or just feeling better about yourself. Giving birth is not for the faint of heart. And so when you imagine this new birth that John speaks of, this new birth as a child of God, don't expect it to be anything less than what we know birth to be. New birth as a child of God, guys, it's going to be messy. <laughs> There's going to be some blood, sweat, and tears. It's going to take some months old. New birth as a child of God, it's a transformation that it brings joy in the end, but it, pro it requires labor. <laughs> there are unexpected complications along the way when you become a, a new person, new birth as a child of God. But it's worth it, right? Just like birth is worth it because of the joy of the new life in our midst. New birth as a child of God, it is worth it because of the new life that is in our midst. This rebirth, this standing as a child of God that you have because of Jesus Christ. This is what you find when you see and you know and you believe in the light of the world. It's what makes you a new person. This is why this idea of rebirth, this is why many Christian traditions still do baptism by full immersion, where uh, the pastor lowers you fully into the water and then raises you back up again. This is why in the early church, the baptismal pools didn't sit up at the top of the chancel, they sat in the basement of the church. Because as a person about to be baptized, as an adult about to be baptized, you would walk down the steps into the waters of the womb. That was the imagery. Into the waters of the womb. And then you would come back up out of the waters of the womb and be born anew. Born anew. New in Christ. A child of God. Being born anew. Power to become children of God. Born not of flesh, not of the the will of man, not of the will of the flesh, not of blood, but of God, born anew. I love that phrase, uh, power to become children of God, not born of blood, of the will of the flesh, of the will of man. It means that you are a child of God. You are freed from the patterns of the old family. You're still going to be part of the family here on earth, physical, biological, adopted, foster, various forms of family here on earth. 
But in the midst of it all, you are freed from the will of that family. You're freed from the, the patterns of the family that might otherwise kind of suck you dry or lead you into destruction. You are free from that because you have new life in the family of Christ. It makes me think of when uh, Lynn and I went to worship at the Helping Up Mission on a Friday in August, and we saw Andrew, Christopher, and Byron uh, graduate from the Spiritual Recovery Program, the one-year uh, program of, for recovery of men who are dealing with drug and alcohol addiction in, in the midst of a number of other challenges. This is being born anew, right? It was not simple, it was not clean, it was not easy, but through this being born anew, they were redeemed, they were renewed, they were restored, they were recreated, and I was most moved by how they were reconciled as well. By Christopher and his daughter being there, his daughter seeing her father in a new light, as a new person, being able to welcome him back to the family again, being able to have a new relationship with him because he was new and starting fresh. Power to become children of God. Friends, this is the good news. We celebrate Jesus' birthday on Christmas, but we also kind of celebrate the way that he gives us a new birth too. Maybe Boxing Day it should be like our spiritual birthday. It's all over again, right? That we celebrate that when Christ comes to the world, he also gives us the chance to be born again. The good news this day is that God is here always. The light shines in the darkness always. And the word spoken over you is love always. In the moment of your birth, through every moment of rebirth and renewal again and again, God's love calls us forward into being new people recreated by the power of the Spirit. Friends, may you see this truth, may you know this Savior, and may you believe in the redeeming and reconciling love and how God wants to change you forever. Let's stand and sing of how we will go forth and shine the light into the world with our closing song, Go Tell It On Night. Try to put his fingerprints on.
have you here this morning. I hope that you have been uplifted by the word of God today in worship. As we head out, I want to share a few announcements with you. Um, first, we have another Labyrinth Retreat. I know, can you raise your hand through there this Saturday for the Labyrinth Retreat? If you're thinking about going, that's one of these fine people. They can tell you all about it. They've told me they've had a wonderful experience learning more about walking the labyrinth with Reverend Jane. And Reverend Jane's offering the same experience again this Tuesday. So if weekends are busy, weekdays are not. Drop by Tuesday. You will be, they'll be meeting in the conference room of Agape and then heading outside to walk the labyrinth together. Um, so that will be a wonderful experience offered this Tuesday. Next Sunday is the deadline for a couple different things. It's the deadline for our mission collection for Earl's Place down in Baltimore. And so we urge you to continue bringing things in for that. And then it's also the deadline to let me know if you have a middle schooler or high schooler who would like to participate in confirmation in January. I know January is kind of far away, but once we have the names, we then need to figure out what day of the week and time works best for the kids who are actually involved, because we've got to work around like sports and all those real life things to make sure that we can make confirmation work for all the kids involved. So please let me know if you have a friend who is not here but should hear this, let me know <laughs> if you have a middle schooler or high schooler who's interested in confirmation so that we can get that on the calendars for the new year. And then I, Kelly, you have progressive dinner tonight, right? Mm -hmm. All right, any youth want to join? Where do they meet? Here at 550. Here at 550. You heard it here first, y'all. Progressive dinner for senior high. I'm looking forward to hearing all about that experience. Friends, would you um, close your eyes and open your hands and hearts and receive this Advent blessing as we go forth from this place. Friends, may the light that enlivens the world, the light that the darkness cannot overcome, loves pure light in Jesus Christ. May that light shine on you and in our world this day. Shine in our hearts, Lord Jesus. Amen. Go in peace. Thank you.